Good. So we're ready to continue on, and we started with sacraments. Uh, last time we went through baptism and confirmation, we talked about the first two sacraments of initiation. And now we're on to Eucharist, and we'll couple that with holy orders. So this is a little thick. We've got some dense things to cover, and there's really a tremendous amount in the catechism. We're really, I'm going to tell you now that we're not going to do justice to this topic, because it's not, it's not possible to do that. So, uh, so we're going to do the best that we can. Just before we get started, um, just a reminder, and Denise will help with reminding people, that um, there are some things that we'll be looking for from the people entering the church. Uh, one is a baptismal certificate if you have been baptized, so from, from wherever you are, or proof of baptism, and I think we've spoken a little bit in some particular cases about how to handle that. Um, and eventually we'll be looking for your choice of a, of a name, uh, for your confirmation name, so we choose the name of a saint, and your choice of a sponsor, someone to be serve as a godparent. Uh, for you who would be a baptized and confirmed adult practicing Catholic in good standing. Those are the, so an adult, at least 16. Adult, baptized, confirmed, practicing Catholic in good standing. So, but in particular, but we mentioned the baptismal certificate because sometimes that takes a little bit of work to find. So don't wait until Holy Week. So let's not wait that long. So uh, whatever we need to do to try to find um, any, whatever information about baptism that we can find is great. Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we ask you to draw us more into our relationship with you, especially through the sacrament of the Eucharist, in which you are truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. May our worship of this sacrament help us to grow in our love for you and our love for one another, especially the least among us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. So, okay, strap in. Here, here we go. So this, is, so this is dense. So we talked about the sacraments of initiation, and we said that there were three. So you're first baptized, and then oftentimes, then next you make first communion, and then finally you get confirmed if you're a young person. But the way that it works in the Eastern tradition of the Catholic Church and the way it will happen at the Easter Vigil is you be first baptized if you're not already baptized. Then you get confirmed immediately after, and then finally you receive Holy Communion, now all in the same Mass. But in this sense, the Catechism em emphasizes the sense that the Eucharist actually is, in, in fact, it completes our work of initiation. Um, so especially the work begun in baptism through the forgiveness of sins, um, perfected in confirmation through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and then completed in the complete in the full initiation through reception of the body of Christ, through reception of the Eucharist. We talk about the Eucharist itself being instituted at the Last Supper. You might remember from the topic that we had on the Blessed Virgin Mary, that we looked at different mysteries of the Rosary, and the last of the luminous mysteries was the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. And it was actually at the same time the institution of the priesthood. So not only were the first priests, we can say, ordained when they received the Eucharist and were told to do this in memory of me. So the apostles became the first priests and Jesus handed, handed on the unleavened bread which he consecrated and said, this is my body. Um, taking the wine, saying, this is my blood. So in that one moment in the Last Supper, we get both the priesthood and the Eucharist, and so that's why we can cover these things together. Um, and the, the gift that we have of the Eucharist, it's, it's one of these things that um, we, knowing the mind of the Lord, um, it's interesting that the Lord took time on the night before he was crucified to celebrate this Passover Supper and to institute this sacrament for us. And one of the things that the Catechism then explains for us, which is in fact a very good and noble thing, is that it was part then of the divine will to perpetuate this sacrifice. So in other words, the participation in the, in the Paschal mystery, in the sacrifice of Christ, in his dying and then rising, so his death on Good Friday and his resurrection on Easter Sunday, we can say that the, the Last Supper on Holy Thursday that the first celebration of the Mass, this was a profound gift given to the Church in which he memorialized the sacrifice that he endured and went through, such that we can repeat the ritual that was given to us, as he says, do this in memory of me, 
And then that becomes for us our participation, our share in that encounter with Christ, which not only occurred on Holy Thursday, but also then reminds us of what he gave up on Good Friday and his resurrection on Easter Sunday. And how do we know that? Because when he took bread, when he took wine, he said, take this all of you, this is my body, take this all of you and drink from it, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant poured out for you and for many for the salvation, um, for, the, for the gift of salvation um, as, a, as, a new, as a new memorial, as a new covenant uh, in his blood. And so as he was about to offer up his body on the cross and about to shed his blood on the cross, he then consecrated his body and blood in sacramental form. Um, and so there, this, and this is why it's really impossible for us to speak adequately about what a profound gift this is. It really becomes one of the most precious gifts that we have. The, when we talk about the Eucharist, we really take care to safeguard and protect um, the consecrated hosts that we have. You might see other sacraments and so we use some of those holy oils at baptism or confirmation and are they important sure sure they are but we don't safeguard them not the way that we do the eucharist that's a whole different thing um, we might bless rings in the sacrament of, of matrimony and you can exchange rings but do we safeguard them in the way that we safeguard the eucharist now, the eucharist is its own is is really something that really stands um, above and beyond uh, all of the other sacraments in terms of its dignity. Um, all of the sacraments are important, but we say of the Eucharist that um, it is the source and the summit of our faith. Um, source meaning that the Eucharist nourishes everything that we do, and the summit meaning it is the destined, the, the goal toward which we strive. So when, the, so when the church uses that expression, which was uh, definitely emphasized in Vatican II, um, the Second Vatican Council, so everything we can say is nourished by and flows from the Eucharist and leads back to the Eucharist. Um, so the Eucharist becomes very central in our Catholic faith. So it's um, uh, really something uh, worthy of our time, worthy of our careful study and consideration today. Um, the uh, Catechism emphasizes different things about the Eucharist, that it is a sacrament of love. It's given to us by Jesus Christ out of love. It is a sign of unity because it binds us together. It binds Catholics throughout the world together. It is a bond of charity because Jesus gave himself to us in charity, in love, and it also encourages us then to be filled with charity toward one another. It is a paschal banquet in which we share in the fruits of Christ's sacrifice. It is a pledge of glory. It is a promise then of the future glory that will be revealed in us. Um, these are just a few, and every one of those things is, is, could be the subject of its own individual talk to elaborate more and more of those different points. Um, one of the things that we also talk about is that there is a liturgy that is celebrated. So Jesus, in fact, um, celebrates a sacrament, a liturgy, a liturgical action, which is using signs and symbols and words um, to communicate also spiritual realities. But that also in this liturgical action, it is also a way in which heaven and earth are bound together. That in the, heaven, in the heavenly liturgy is connected to the celebration of the mass when we gather together here on earth. So it's a participation even already here and now in that heavenly liturgy. Um, and it is a sign, it, it uses signs, but they are efficacious signs. Um, they carry with them an effect. And what is the effect of those signs? What is the effect of that ritual? Is that it actually brings about a union between man and God. It connects us to God, and it also connects us to one another. It creates a union among all the people of God as well. Um, so some very profound things. That's a, that's a lot. What I just said is kind of, there's, it's very dense and there's a lot in there. Uh, but those are some of the initial observations, just the initial observations the Catechism makes when talking about the Eucharist. Um, but let's get a little bit more practical and let's talk about the names that we say. So the word Eucharist itself. Um, does anyone know just offhand what that word itself actually means or where, what it comes from? Um, it, it's, this has to do with the, the, the original word in Greek, so I, no one's expected to know this. I, it's just more trivia if you happen to have heard that before. Um, so it's when they talk about Jesus taking bread and then he gave thanks, 
The word for giving thanks this in the, in the Greek is eucharisteo. That's the verb that's used. It means to give thanks. It comes, actually comes from a, a com, combination of words that means a good grace. It comes from the word for grace as well. So thanksgiving is a, is a way of describing that. So Eucharist is the, um, the bread taken up and having giving thanks, having given thanks. Um, so, so Jesus gave thanks, and it's from that verb to give thanks that we get the word Eucharist. But we also use other terms um, other than the Eucharist. Just off the top of your head, are there some other terms that you also have, um, that you're familiar with, that we sometimes use when referring to the Eucharist? Like we don't, we don't always just say here, the Eucharist of Christ, amen. I just, like sometimes I use other words, other, we use other words than Eucharist. So what might be some other words that we use that would also indicate the same thing, but we just use different terminology? Body. The body of Christ. Okay, so there's one, there's another thing. So when we say body of Christ, we're also talking about the Eucharist. Another thing, for example, if someone makes their first holy communion. So communion is another word that we use. So we use Eucharist, we use communion, we use body of Christ. Um, another um, thing, some other words that are used um, sometimes we talk about it as the divine liturgy. So this is a, a, which is another way of de describing the ritual that we celebrate. Um, or when we talk about the mass, um, we also speak of it as because Jesus offered something at the mass and say, oh, well, I'm going to offer you a gift. Well, Jesus offered a gift, but it was also, it was the same gift that he was going to offer up on the cross. And so sometimes we talk about that as a sacrifice. So we can speak about the sacrifice of the Mass, the celebration of Holy Communion, the Divine Liturgy, or sometimes we just say the Mass. So this is the Mass um, that we celebrate. And this is, this is to speak not just simply about the Eucharistic self, but when we talk about the Eucharistic celebration or the Eucharistic Liturgy, we could say Mass, uh, Divine Liturgy, um, celebration of Holy Communion, uh, or sacrifice of the Mass there. Um, and the term mass itself, um, do, does anyone happen to know, again, total trivia, you're not, you, you don't, you know, just, it's more if you've heard this before, what the, where the term mass actually comes from. So every once in a while, someone kind of knows like one of these little tri points of trivia. So I'm just, just curious there. So in the, in the old mass that when they'd say the mass is ended, go in peace, they, they would say in Latin, they'd say, ita misa est. And he says, and he'd say, and then the, everyone would say, Deo gratias. You know what Deo gratias means? That one you might be able to figure out. So that's, so that's, so gracias okay. is Spanish for thank you. So, um, so Deo gratias is thanks be to God. So that go forth, the mass is ended. So ite is the thing that says, go forth. And then misa es, misa, it actually comes from the verb, or from the word miss, the same same root as the word missio, which is a mission, and so sometimes they say that the, that you are sent or it is sent. It's a, the idea that there is a mission that we receive, and that we in fact are sent forth. So just from that expression, I know it sounds. So go forth, you. It is sent. It is you know, or go forth. You have been given a mission. Um, that was, that's maybe a really, really literal way of translating that very last expression that we say at Mass, go forth, the Mass is ended. Well, it's from that expression, from mission or missio or misa, as they would say, that we get the word Mass. So, total trivia point there, but it's a, so, but the word Mass itself relates to the idea that there is a mission, meaning that the Eucharist itself also then leads us into action. So in other words, we've, we encounter Christ, and that leads us to behave differently uh, when we go forth. So we're nourished by the Eucharist when we're in church, and that should affect what we do or how we behave or what, um, what actions we take outside of church. Um, and so re having received the body of Christ, we are changed in this regard. Uh, and so need to reflect that change then when we carry forth the graces that we have received into the world. Um, another thing that is um, sometimes when we talk about the, the elements of the Mass, uh, what was Jesus doing at the time when he gathered his disciples together? He told them to go, go and prepare a room for him to celebrate the, he was gonna celebrate an Old Testament ritual because it was, the time, it was the time for the Jews to gather in Jerusalem for the celebration of 
Passover. Okay. And so this is actually connected to an Old Testament um, ritual. So if you remember um, anything about the Old Testament, about if you've seen Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments or anything, um, anything like that. I, the, the, um, uh, so do you know what happened at the Passover itself? Is that, do you know what was offered up at the Passover? Everyone's all nervous. I know no one is. And I have to stay behind the camera. I could, I could go, I could go out and talk to you. I could pick the camera up. I could go walking around. And then, and then I could do my Phil Donahue and just say, like, okay, I could, I could put the microphone in for you. I won't do that. Okay. So if you remember the, uh, the story of Moses, the people were slaves. The Hebrews were slaves to the Egyptians. And God sent Moses in order to free the Hebrews from their slavery. And in order to convince Pharaoh, there were different plagues that were sent. And so Moses then would inflict a plague or say that the Lord will send a plague upon you. Plague after plague after plague. Um, nine plagues came and went. Pharaoh relented. He changed his mind. He would not let the people go. And then finally comes the tenth plague. And the tenth plague is going to be the angel of death. So the angel of death is going to descend upon the land and kill, strike down all of the firstborn in the land, both of mankind and of animals. And, but, the, uh, but the Hebrews were told what to do on this night. And if they, in fact, were to follow the instructions that were given to them by Moses, then the angel of death would pass over their houses. And, but those who did not, in fact, do what, what Moses told them, uh, the firstborn in their house would actually be slain. And so what was it that they were told to do? Well, they were told to take a lamb. So it was to be an unblemished lamb with no bones that were to be broken. And it was to be slaughtered in the evening twilight. Its flesh was to be um, roasted. And then they were to consume the, um, the flesh of the lamb. So they were to receive from the Passover lamb. But the blood of the lamb was important too because they were to take the blood and they were to apply the blood then to the doorposts and to the lintels, so to the window frames and to the door frames of the houses where they were. And seeing the blood of the lamb, the angel of death would pass over that house. And so um, this was a dangerous thing because you basically had to mark your house saying, you know, you had to, you had to be public about what you were doing. You either, you either put the blood on the door of your house or you didn't. And if you did, you said you were believing Moses and you were marking yourself in that sense. And if you didn't, then you, then if you were afraid to do that, well, then you were going to suffer the consequences of the angel of death. So it really was a, a tremendous act of faith. And after that, Pharaoh then was so angry that he sent the Hebrews away. He, 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 he sent them out and eventually then they crossed the Red Sea and made their way from there into the desert to the mountain of God and the, later to the promised land. But it was there at that Passover meal that you had the lamb that was sacrificed. And so when we talk about the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, we are connecting to the idea of the lamb that was offered at the Passover. Um, on the night of Passover, because they were in such haste, they had to be prepared, they had to be ready to flee at a moment's notice. And so there was no time to bake any, any bread or to leaven the bread. If you wanted to make bread, you had to mix the, the dough and the yeast and you had to give it time to rise. That takes time. There was no time. So their bread was unleavened that they ate that time. And so they would eat the unleavened bread with bitter herbs and then they'd eat the, the blood of the lamb and they would take up the cup, um, the cup of blessings that would be part of the Passover ritual. And this would become something that was part of a, um, an annual tradition that the Jews would celebrate. Um, so when Jesus was saying he was going to celebrate the Passover, we're connecting to this entire history, this history that is built into Judaism that represented the moment at which then the Lord intervened in a radical way in order to bring them from death to life, to save them from death, in order to free them from slavery, um, to set them free. And that was the fruit of that. And it came from the unleavened bread. It came from the offering of wine. It came from the Passover lamb that was sacrificed. And so Jesus, in fact, is the, the true lamb of God, um, whose blood actually then saves us. And so we eat the unleavened bread of the Eucharist, which is offered up and consecrated, except this time that it becomes the body of Christ. And we also drink the cup of blessings, which is the wine that is offered at that moment, except that Jesus says this is his blood, and it becomes his blood. Um, and so the, these are some of the things that really connect back to these Old Testament traditions. 
um, remembering different sacrifices. And, and so after that, when they came into the, the promised land, they would offer up sacrifices. And sometimes those, offer, those offerings would be cereal offerings. They would offer grain. They would offer bread. Um, they would offer up libations of wine. And so these were offerings. What were they bringing? They were bringing their first fruits. So one of the traditions that you see from the Old Testament is that the people would bring the best of what they had and they would offer it up to the Lord. Um, and so it was a sign of making a return to the Lord for all that, they, that the Lord had done for them. So when we bring bread and wine, we are reminding ourselves also of this great tradition um, that is there um, in, which, in which oftentimes bread and wine would be offered, sometimes by a, a mystical figure from the early part of Genesis named Melchizedek who brought out an offering of bread and wine. Um, it's another beautiful passage. I won't, I won't take more time to, to go into it other than that, uh, than just to mention that. But uh, as they would celebrate the Passover, the Passover itself was always kind of in expectation of the, this fulfillment, that just as God had freed them from slavery to the Egyptians in the past, there was also this sense like, yes, so the Jews would say, well, yes, next year we will do this in Jerusalem. There was a sense of looking forward, not just looking back, but looking forward. And so the Mass itself, they were waiting for that time at which then the Messiah would come. So the Passover was waiting for its fulfillment, and we can say that Jesus, in celebrating the Last Supper, fulfills the original intent of the Passover. He actually perfects the Passover, brings it to its full completion. Um, but in addition to Old Testament symbols, there are also other New Testament things that we could also look to as well. Um, so, for example, if I was to talk about any miracle that Jesus would perform with bread, so at the Last Supper he could take bread and he performed a miracle because he, he ch changed bread into his body. But if there was ever another miracle that Jesus performed with bread that was really um, significant, that affected so many people, perhaps even four or five thousand people, for example, what would that be? What was another miracle Jesus did with bread? Okay, you're just all nervous. He fed? He fed the masses with how many? What did, what did he have? Okay, just a small number of, well, okay. That depending on the, it's repeated more than once in the gospel, but sometimes you'll see like with even as few as five loaves and a, and a few fish or with two fish. Um, that he was able to feed so many. So the multiplication of the loaves, that from, from a small amount he could break the bread. The breaking of the bread was an important thing too because you had the one offering that is there, but if you want to share it with many people, then you have to break the bread so it can be broken and shared to be distributed. So from the one, so you break the bread so that the many can be fed. But ironically, the many who receive the body of Christ are actually all made one. So, there's, so the one feeds the many, but the many themselves are all one. Um, if I was to say this, I, before long, I think I'd be, if I kept going, I'm going to be quoting from Leonard Nimoy from Star Trek II, I think. It said, it says, so whether it's you can, you can offer something for the many or for the one or something like that. I said, but now that, that's into Star Trek. Does, that, does anyone know what I'm talking about here? It's, okay, I just, go watch Star Trek II. If you, okay, so that's, okay, so. The, uh, that none of you, you're too young. You, none of you know what I'm talking about. So, okay. <laughs> but no, there is something about the breaking of the bread and, and that. So the multiplication of the loaves is another one. What about a miracle Jesus would perform with, with uh, wine? Or maybe not with wine. Maybe he'd perform it with water. How about that? Oh, spoiler alert. I'm good. Okay. What's the miracle that Jesus performed there that we might say is a kind of a forerunner or a precursor for what Jesus would do at the Last Supper? So do you remember what happened with water? He changed water into wine. Do you remember where? At a wedding banquet, okay, at the wedding feast of Cana. So there, there was a place the wine ran out and there were, there were these large jars there for a washing and they were filled with water. Jesus transformed water into wine. If Jesus can change water into wine, he can change wine into blood. Um, and so there, in the multiplication of the loaves or in the changing of water into wine, we have two different examples of Jesus uh, performing miracles that involve bread and wine. Um, and this, we might say, also prepares us for this greater miracle, this truly profound miracle to be performed at the Last Supper. If we read John chapter 6, there is an entire chapter of John's Gospel that speaks at great length 
about the changing of, uh, it says, my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Unless you eat the flesh, eat my flesh and drink my blood, you do not have life within you. And we refer to that as the bread of life. So um, the, uh, I am the bread come down from heaven that you may eat of it and not die. Um, and so there is a, a, a tremendous uh, section in which Jesus goes on at great length to talk about the, the, um, uh, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, which are consumed and which are, bring salvation. Um, and, uh, and in fact, it even says at the end of John chapter 6, he says, many people heard this talk and they said, this sounds so crazy. This is hard to endure. And many people left because they said, this sounds like too much. This is not, this doesn't make any sense. But the disciples, however, for those who believe, they said, no, we will not leave you. They says, you have the words of eternal life. So rather than uh, to whom shall we go, Peter says, you have the words of eternal life. And so they remain faithful. They listen to this teaching, this challenging teaching. It is a, it is a hard thing for us to wrap our minds around. Um, and yet for the disciples, they, they um, did take in and they were not scared of what Jesus had to say. And so then uh, Jesus, the night of the Last Supper, takes bread and takes wine and offers them up and then says to do this in memory of me and the apostles did that. So in the Acts of the Apostles, we have uh, examples of how the apostles would gather in particular on the Lord's Day. What day is the Lord's Day? Sunday. So we don't say they gathered on the Sabbath. On the seventh day, they gathered on the Lord's Day on the first day of the week or the eighth day, you might say. Not the seventh day, but the eighth day. And that's the reason why we observe Sunday, which is the day of resurrection, as opposed to Saturday, which would be the Old Testament Sabbath. So the day of rest in Old Testament times was Saturday, the seventh day, the Sabbath day. But the Sunday is the first day of the week. It is the beginning of a new creation, a new creation because it is the day on which the Lord rose from the dead. And so that's why we focus on the breaking of the bread, which we celebrate on Sundays. And that becomes for us this day of um, this fundamental day of obligation, except when it's not obligatory, like, like now. So, um, the, so that's the crazy time that we're in right now. But normally Sunday is the, is the principal feast that we celebrate. So and we celebrate that each week. Um, so on Sunday, we, we gather for the celebration of the Mass. If you go back into the history of the church, the, even from the first century, um, there are documents that talk about the teachings of the apostles. There's a, a, um, a document called the Didache, Apostolorum, which just means the teachings of the apostles, and they describe in a very kind of preliminary form what the Mass was like, and it has the same structure and the same format as, as to what we do today. So from the first century, we have that initial description. St. Justin Martyr in the second century elaborates on that and gives us more of a sense of what happens at the liturgy. And then as time goes on, um, then it became more and more standardized in different places, especially some of the different missals that were composed and written, um, were taken up by the universal church and then eventually standardized. Um, in particular, they were in the Council of Trent in the 1500s, there was the, the composition of and the ordering of the Tridentine Mass. Tridentine just meaning it came from the Council of Trent. So, and that was the, the Mass as it was celebrated in Latin for centuries until Vatican II, so in the 20th century, and then we have what we now use as the Novus Ordo, or just means the New Order of Mass. Um, the, new, the Novus Ordo, the Mass that we know today, bears a strong resemblance in its structure. Its fundamental structure is not changed from the Tridentine Mass and the versions of the Mass as it had been, as it had come to us in the centuries before and even from the first century. The Mass we know today, however, can be celebrated in the common languages rather than celebrating it in Latin. So it's much more accessible to us because we can understand all of that, but still the elements are the same and the elements are composed of the introductory rites um, in which we ask for the forgiveness of sins and we praise God and we gather our thoughts together. But then we, in, in particular, focus on the word of God and we listen to the word and the word is explained and we call that a homily. We offer up our prayers, we call those intercessions as we unite um, our prayers with the needs of the entire church. But the liturgy of the word gives way to the liturgy of the Eucharist, as gifts are brought forward, as the people bring forward their first fruits, as the gifts of bread and wine are offered, um, as the blessing is, is said, and just as Jesus did at the multiplication of the loaves, 
And as Jesus did at the Last Supper, he took the bread, and right? remember he did this when multiplying the loaves and fish as well, but he does the same thing at the Last Supper. He takes the bread, he gives thanks, remember Eucharisteo, so that's Eucharist. Um, he, he takes it, blesses it, um, or, or, or gives thanks for it, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to the disciples, saying, take this all of you and eat of it. So the elements are all there, and that, and that after that they're re reciting the Lord's Prayer, receiving communion, um, and there being a blessing um, that is given as well. So this structure of the Mass, even though we might say it went through different changes, even in the 20th century, so in the 1960s, um, in between 1962 and 1965, and then eventually by 1970, as different translations were, were completed, so we have the new Mass as it has come to us, but it is still very much the same Mass, um, very much connected with the traditions that have existed in the past. Um, the Mass is presided over by a presider, so the one who leads. The presider then stands in the person of Christ the head. Um, and so in that sense, we can say that Christ is the celebrant of every Mass, um, but the priest is standing in the place of Christ. So this is where when we talk about holy orders, we can't really talk about Eucharist without talking about the priesthood at the same time. Um, and so this is an important aspect as well, is that we say that Christ is present then in every assembly, and in fact Christ presides over every, every Mass. Um, because the priest doesn't take the host and say, take this all of you and eat of it, this is Christ's body. He says, take this all of you and eat it, this is my body. So he's taking the words of Christ for himself. Just as he doesn't say, Christ baptizes you in the name of the Father, he says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son. So the, uh, so the presider is always speaking in the name of Christ, and we might say also speaking um, in the name of the church as well. And so what is, what is being done? What does the presider do? The presider is offering back to the Father the sacrifice of the Son. You might say that's pretty presumptuous for someone to take it upon themselves and say, Oh, Father, I offer you the sacrifice of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus told us to do that. He says, do this in memory of me. And so he told them to repeat this action. And so that is, in fact, what we do. So this is, and this actually um, is, uh, so it is a representation of the original sacrifice that Jesus offered at the Last Supper. But it is, it's not, there's no pride in that. It's really for our benefit. It's, it's our privilege to be brought into and inserted into this mystery. Um, the, uh, when we celebrate Mass, then so then we're offering up a sacrifice. And we can also offer that sacrifice for specific things. So we can all pray for specific things when we are at Mass. But sometimes you'll even hear that the Mass itself is offered for a specific intention. So I say this, off, this Mass is offered for a certain person. And in particular, to offer that for people who have passed. That's a very, very common thing. There's a noble tradition there. And so people sometimes ask for masses to be said. My grandmother just passed. So I'd say, now, I, I, as an example, I don't, I, okay, I didn't mean my grandmother actually has, has passed. My, my grandmother has passed, but it didn't just happen. Um, but you say, oh, so I have someone who died, and so I'd like to have a mass said. So would you please offer mass for this particular person? Um, and so when offering the Mass, so we're offering back to the Father, but then, and so what do we receive? So that bread is brought to the altar, wine is brought to the altar, and then it is changed. And so it becomes Christ. It becomes Christ whole and entire. It becomes Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Christ truly present in a sacramental form. It's kind of hard, to, I think, to wrap our minds around just exactly what that means. So Christ is substantially present. Um, so I know we don't see him in the way that we would normally see him as if he were walking on earth and we say, okay, he walked from here to there. But it is Christ who is actually present. Not theoretically present, not symbolically present. We would say truly present. So we say sometimes we, we speak of that as the true presence of the Eucharist. There's a fancy name for what happens when something changes from one substance into another substance. Does anyone know what happens when one substance changes into another substance when it transforms and trans changes from one thing to another. We call that transubstantiation. Transubstantiation. So that's why, okay, that's why I set you up for that there. So, so transubstantiation is what, is what we believe about the Eucharist. That is the changing of one thing into another thing. 
normally this is an impossibility. So normally to change one thing into another thing, you have to, you have to destroy the other, the previous thing in its entirety for it to change. But here in this case, um, the bread becomes the body of Christ, but it still retains all of the other properties of bread. In other words, its appearance remains the same. So how it touches, tastes, feels, seems to be all identical, and yet it has in fact become something different. Um, just as when a person is baptized, we'd say, well, a person looks the same, so all we did is we got your hair wet. Except that's not entirely true, because something has actually changed. So just as you are actually changed in baptism, you are set free from sin, that is a real spiritual transformation that takes place. You have been incorporated and marked by Christ when you are baptized. Even though it doesn't look like there's anything different on the outside, with eyes of faith you can see that baptism has actually accomplished a profound change. Um, so also, when the bread is offered up and consecrated, it in fact is changed. A profound change has taken place because it is no longer ordinary bread. It becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus. And we say that that uh, presence of Christ in the Eucharist subsists as long as that Eucharistic bread is in its, in its same form. When it's digested, okay, then it, then it in fact is eventually broken down. Um, and so forth. But as long as it still remains the host, it, the Christ is truly present. Not just for the duration of the Mass, but after the Mass too. And that's why we take whatever remains of the Eucharist. So just as the multiplication of the loaves, they say, gather up all the fragments so nothing may go to waste. And so we also make sure to gather up any hosts that are not consumed, and then we take them and place them in the tabernacle. Um, one of the traditions behind that from ancient days um, so initially, there, were, there weren't tabernacles initially. Initially, there weren't even churches. They would just, they would gather in a home, in, um, in house churches initially. But eventually, the idea of retaining the Blessed Sacrament was, um, began even in the first century. So that way, the Blessed Sacrament, that's, there's another term for the Eucharist, Blessed Sacrament. So the Blessed Sacrament could be brought to the sick who could not come. So, and so the idea of bringing communion to the homebound um, to those who are sick or those who are ill, that's another ancient tradition. You see us do that um, every weekend, too. So there are people who are taking communion to the sick, and so we pray for them, and that's um, a noble thing. And so they began to reserve the Eucharist so it could be brought to the sick, and eventually it would be reserved in a tabernacle, and it became a place for prayer. It can also be reserved because we have adoration. So adoration is when we'll bring a host and place the host in a monstrance, um, was, I just put up a f post on Facebook, you, so you could see the, um, we're going to have a holy hour tomorrow evening, so at 7, from 7 to 8, we'll place the host in the monstrance, so no one's going to receive communion, we're not going to have mass, but a previously consecrated host will be placed in the monstrance, and it's just a time for prayer, um, because we believe that Jesus still continues to be truly present in that host that was consecrated even previously. Um, one of the things about the Eucharist, because we believe it is truly Christ, it is one of the most sacred things that we have in the church, more precious and more important than any gold object or any precious work of art, is the Eucharist. And to an outsider, they'd say, you're taking more care to safeguard and to protect this piece of bread than you are taking to protect this, these precious vessels that you have. To which I say, yes. Yeah, that is correct. So the Eucharist is, in fact, the most important thing that we have in the church itself. Um, and such that if a person were to take a host and actually um, treat it contemptibly, if they were to do something sacrilegious with it, that person would be excommunicated. That is absent. Um, uh, if I were to abuse a host for some reason, I would be excommunicated and would not be able to celebrate Mass. It's such a serious thing. Um, it's serious as breaking the seal of confession for a priest. The priests are not allowed to do that. So also we're not allowed to, to mistreat or treat in a sacrilegious way um, any host. And so sometimes, if you ever see us, if, if someone comes up and they obviously don't know what they're doing and they receive a host and they walk away with it and you see that they still have it in their hand. And if you ever watch us like, you know, follow them back to the pew and then say, well, you need to either consume that or return that. We're not trying to embarrass them. The Eucharist is that important that we cannot allow um, the Eucharist to be disrespected, you know, in any way. Um, a person might say, oh, oh, a souvenir. Oh, okay, I'll put it in my pocket. And you'd be horrified. We'd be horrified by that. 
Um, because um, for us who believe um, that, no, that is our Lord Jesus himself, and that's not to be treated casually in any way. So if we are specific about saying, consume the host, or we want to make sure that the host is, is treated properly, that's the reason why. Um, we mentioned that our senses often deceive us. So to all of our senses, it looks like we're still just talking about bread. So what we see, what we taste, what we touch, the one sense that Thomas Aquinas reminds us, though, that we can trust, he says, the one thing you can trust, though, is your hearing. What do you mean by that? What do you, the host doesn't make any noise. Okay, but what do you hear? It's this, if you, if you were deprived of all your other senses, and the only thing that you were able to do was to listen and to hear, what you hear is, take this all of you and eat it, this is my body. Your hearing tells you the truth, in this case but all of your other senses can, can deceive you. Um, and so this is something that can really only be perceived by eyes of faith. So it really takes eyes of faith to be able to see and believe um, that this is our Lord truly present. That in fact, when we are invited to the altar, this is in fact the table of the Lord, a, a time, our participation in the Paschal banquet. And, uh, and in fact, this is an important thing that, uh, as Jesus says in John 6, that unless you eat the flesh, eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. But one of the things, because the Eucharist is so precious, that St. Paul warns people about, being, um, about consuming such a precious gift um, in an unworthy state. And this is something that is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, when he talks about the importance then of... Um, of what is done there as he talks about the ritual um, he says this is my body he says this is this is what our Lord Jesus commanded us to do therefore whoever eats the, the bread and drinks the cup however of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord a person should examine himself then um, so as to eat the bread and drink the cup in a worthy manner for anyone who eats or drinks without discerning the body eats or drinks his own judgment on himself um, and so he warns us then to make sure that we are ready to receive worthily. So um, our Lord Jesus Christ is the all sinless one, and so we want to be very careful so as to avoid being in a state of sin. So that's why sometimes you'll hear us talk about mortal sin, are we in a state of grace? So, so when we receive the sacraments, we want to be in a state of grace. If we're not in a state of grace, then it's important to be forgiven of our grave sins, of mortal sins by first going to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Um, so that way we can be made worthy to receive such a precious gift. That's how precious the Eucharist is. Um, remember what we say just before receiving communion. We repeat the words that the centurion said. It says, Lord, I am not worthy. So we remind ourselves, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Um, and so it's important that we recognize that we are in the presence of our Lord who has created us and who has known us from before we ever came to be. And he's present to us in the form of this small, tiny host and this small wafer of bread. One of the things we celebrate at Christmas time, which is so wonderful, is the mystery of imagining the God who fashioned the entire universe being born and lying helpless in a manger with nothing but shepherds and the, and the oxen in the manger there in order to witness that moment. The God in all of his majesty is born in such a lowly and humble and dependent state. I think in an equally humble way, the Lord Jesus comes to us also through the Eucharist um, and allows us, he, he allows himself to pass into human hands to be consecrated in the hands of an ordinary priest. When I say ordinary, but I mean a priest has been set aside for divine worship for this purpose, to consecrate the host. Um, and, and this is the Lord who has fashioned and created everything and who has saved us. So he comes to us in, in very humble and unassuming ways at Christmas, in the, in the manger, in the Eucharist, and through the host. Um, and yet this is still the same Christ, truly present to us. Um, the uh, And so the... Um, when we celebrate the Mass, one of the things that the Mass itself does is it helps dispose us then to meet the Lord and receive him. So how is it that the Mass helps us? Well, it brings us into a time of prayer 
so that way we're beginning to ready ourselves. We're calling to mind our sins, we're listening to his word, we're preparing our hearts, we're focusing on him, we're offering up our prayers, we're praising him and thanking him. Uh, we're reciting the prayer in which he, he taught us to pray, asking for this daily bread um, that uh, he is ready to give to us. We acknowledge our unworthiness, we kneel before him, um, and then and we're ready to receive. So being disposed, being prepared. The Eucharist isn't something then that we receive mindlessly, as though um, it's a, you know, the, the way that a person might be watching Netflix and then, uh, oh, I'm just putting popcorn <laughs> into my mouth. Well, we don't just put the Eucharist into our mouth mindlessly while we're doing something else. Um, no, the, you, that, that really calls for our whole focus as we, as we receive communion. Um, another way we prepare ourselves is also by observing the fast, the Eucharistic fast. Um, sometimes this is something you might not hear a lot about, but um, it still is a tradition. Uh, it used to be that you had to fast before receiving communion for a much longer time. Now the church asks us to fast for one hour from anything except for water and medication. Um, and so, and, and unless we're sick, a person who's sick is not, is not bound by this Eucharistic fast. But we fast from other foods for an hour before receiving communion so as to prepare ourselves and help us, in fact, to be, begin to hunger to be fed. And we're fed this time by the spiritual food. Um, we're fed by something that is, in fact, more noble than that. And being fed by the Eucharist, it is, in fact, um, something that nourishes us in a way that really is different from ordinary food. The, if, 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 any, if, um, if there are people who are Lord of the Rings fans, for J.R.R. Tolkien, when he would talk about the, the elvish whey bread, the, the lembus bread, that was it. J.R.R. Tolkien was very much steeped in the theology of the Eucharist. So for him to have this precious bread that nourished even in a, in a more effective way, than even ordinary food that was anyway so J.R.R. Tolkien had the Eucharist as part of his he was Catholic and this is very much in, under in his thinking and very much influenced his um, descriptions of that in that fantasy work of that of that type of bread but it's um, yeah all, all connected to the Eucharist and in, in his um, uh, as part of his background for that um, some of the fruits that come from receiving the Eucharist uh, so the, the Eucharist then uh, brings us into greater union with Jesus Christ. So, of course, receiving his body. Isn't that interesting that normally we eat food and we take the food and we turn the food into our body. So, the, uh, so we eat, eat food and we eat the Big Mac and we turn the Big Mac into fat. Okay. And we store fat in our body. body. No, no, but we eat food and we need that to create, you know, it becomes part of our body and bones and muscle and fiber and tissue and all those things. But when we receive the Eucharist, we receive the body of Christ, but we actually become turned into Christ's body. We become members of his body. We actually end up being more united to Christ in that. So it's actually one of those um, funny things that is there is that rather than Christ um, being changed, and then we're the, we're the ones who incorporate Christ. It's rather we are the ones who are changed when we receive Christ and we are incorporated into him spiritually, into his, into his body. Um, so we become more united to Christ and more members of the body of Christ. It renews within us the graces. The grace is already given to us in baptism, um, strengthens our desires for virtue. It, it um, helps separate us more and more from sin. Um, it, it strengthens our desire um, to practice charity and the example of Jesus Christ, especially being concerned for the needs of those who are most poor. Um, it can wipe away the effects of venial sin. It creates a stronger bond between us and the church and all the members of the church. Um, it is also something that creates within us a deeper hunger also for Christ's coming and to see him in his future glory. Because in the Eucharist, we are receiving him who we cannot see now only with eyes of faith but we're receiving the one who we will see face to face in eternity um, and so it actually increases within us a desire then to be with him um, one of the things that happens sometimes with um, different protestants is they may have communion um, sometimes different protestant churches will have a, a reenactment of the lord's supper but oftentimes they don't believe the same thing as the catholic church does, does anyone come from a protestant background where you would have the celebration of communion and but, but where it might have a different meaning from transubstantiation the idea that it is truly changed 
I know in some churches they have consubstantiation. They have the belief that Christ is somehow present with the the bread or the or the grape juice that is offered, but but that it's not really permanently changed. There's something like that's that's another example. That's not what Catholics believe. Catholic Catholics believe it's truly changed and transformed. So it doesn't it doesn't go it doesn't turn back into bread when we're when we're done when we don't need it anymore. Um, the uh, and for this reason. Um, oftentimes we do not have what they call intercommunion between the Catholic Church and different other Christian churches because we don't believe the same things. Intercommunion means that we can take communion from each other so that we give communion to you, you give communion to us because we are, we believe the same thing. Um, the only people with whom we have intercommunion, so there will be different other Catholic churches like for example St. Charbel that is a Maronite Catholic Church. They believe the same thing about the Eucharist that the Latin Catholic Church believes. The Maronite Catholics, the Latin Catholics, or Roman Catholics, as we would say, um, we're all, we all recognize the authority of the Holy Father, so we have the same authority. We're under the same authority of the Pope. Uh, we believe, the same, uh, believe in the same sacraments and the same teachings, so there's no difference. We have intercommunion there. You can receive communion at St. Charles. That is the Eucharist, that's Catholic communion. Um, and uh, but in other cases, sometimes we're not talking about churches where we believe the same things, and so we don't actually have intercommunion. Um, I need to take a little bit of time to also talk a little bit more about the priesthood. Now, I've kind of mentioned it already because we mentioned the apostles were ordained to offer the sacrifice, and they did, and they did. They celebrated. They did this in memory of Jesus on the Lord's day. But in order to continue that work, the apostles then continued then to lay on hands as they would go out and, and proclaim Jesus Christ to others, they would pray over uh, certain people, they would pray over certain men, lay hands on them, and choose them as presbyters or overseers, um, to use a different word, uh, the word for episcopus or bishop. Um, so they would choose different bishops, different presbyters, and also different deacons. And so all of this is mentioned in the, um, in the New Testament. So we have from the first century, the laying on of hands and the consecration of different men for these different orders. So we have the episcopate or bishops, we have the presbyterate or priests, we have the diaconate or deacons. And so those three orders are with us uh, to this day. The, the right by which you are inserted into one of those three orders is called ordination. And ordination, so we talk about being ordained, um, it means that we are inserted into the order of deacons, the order of priests, the order of bishops by um, consecration and the laying on of hands. Um, and, uh, and so that's where the term holy orders comes in. So the sacrament is called holy orders, comes from becoming a member of one of these orders or being ordained. So it is a consecration. Um, it is uh, being entrusted with a sacred power, not for one's own sake, but for service. So ordination is, is entirely about service. So those who are ordained as bishops, priests, or deacons are called to serve, called to serve the church, to give from what they have received. And in, in fact, in many ways, it is a, um, a tall order because Jesus reminds us that to whom much has been given, much will be expected. And so bishops, uh, deacons, priests, and then especially bishops, much has been given and much is asked. And uh, that is one of the reasons why um, we should always pray for our, uh, for our clergy. Um, pray for your priests, pray for, pray for more priests, pray for your bishops especially. So bishops need prayers, our Holy Father needs prayers. So it's always an important thing to do, um, always and everywhere. Um, the, uh, some of this is connected to Old Testament things, like the priesthood in the Old Testament, like the tribe of Levi, was chosen. They were set aside. They were set apart, and it was their responsibility to offer sacrifices. So, also in the ordained priesthood, or the ministerial priesthood, or sometimes they say the hierarchical priesthood, these would be men who have been set apart for the offering of sacrifices. Um, and so, there's a connection back with the priesthood of Levi. Um, though you might remember that um, we talk about all of us sharing in the one priesthood of Jesus Christ. By virtue of our baptism. All of us share in Christ's priesthood, but those that have been set apart specifically by the sacrament of holy orders in the ministerial priesthood are there to serve also the church, which is to serve the members of the common baptized priesthood. So the, the common priesthood we all share by virtue of baptism, 
um, everyone who has been baptized, everyone who's a member of the church is served by those who have been set apart um, in the ministerial priesthood um, for the celebration of sacred rites. And, that, and we're all bound together in that one body of Christ. Um, the, so when we talk about the, those different orders, let me just briefly say something about all three. Let me start with the bishops. So the bishops are the successors of the apostles. Um, they have the fullness of the priesthood. And sometimes we might say, this gets kind of confusing because I thought, wouldn't priests have the priesthood? How do bishops have the fullness of the priesthood? What does that mean? And this is where, if, the, if we were speaking in Latin right now, this would be so much clearer. You would understand it perfectly if we were speaking in Latin right now. Because no, there are two terms, there are two different words. So when they say sacerdus, sacerdus is the general word meaning for priest. And a, and a sacerdus or a sacerdos is someone who is a, is a priest or sacerdos, uh, bishops or sacerdos. Now, a priest, though, is called specific. If you're talking about a priest who's not a bishop, they use the term presbyter, pres, presbyter in, in Latin, presbyter or presbyteris. And um, uh, so they, they have two different words. So that's why, see, whereas both words get translated into English as priesthood. So it sounds a little weird in English because it sounds like I'm repeating myself. Um, but bishops have the fullness of the priesthood. They can celebrate all the sacraments. So every sacrament, every one of the seven sacraments, they can celebrate, including the sacrament of ordination. Um, so bishops, only bishops can, can be the celebrants for the sacrament of, of holy orders, the celebrant for it to confer ordination on, uh, on someone else as bishop, priest, or deacon. Um, bishops normally in, in the Roman church are the only ones who can confirm. And then priests can confirm only by way of exception. But so those are two sacraments that usually get more explicitly reserved for bishops. Bishops are responsible then not only as successors of the apostles for ordaining, but for pre preaching, teaching, and sanctifying. They also govern the church. You might remember at the very beginning we, when we talked about the magisterium and the deposit of faith, they were the authentic teachers. That's the authentic magister magisterium. Those who teach the faith in the name of the church. Um, and so they exercise a special role that is there. Um, so then what about the priests? What about the second, that second order? So the priests celebrate sacraments, sure, okay. So they offer mass, bishops offer mass. So there are lots of things we have in common, but the priests are considered the co-workers of the bishops. So the priests in a special way are bound to the bishops. Um, and so in a diocese, so we are bound, especially by, by obedience to our bishop, to our diocesan bishop. The priests of the diocese of Peoria bound to the bishop of Peoria. And in this, we are co-workers with him. And then we help in the discharging of the um, of, the, of these duties and the preaching and the teaching and the sanctifying um, by working in parishes and in other institutions. So by saying mass, by hearing confessions, by baptizing, by celebrating other sacraments, by preaching, by proclaiming the word. So the priests are assistants. Um, they can confirm, celebrate confirmation by exception, but they cannot ordain. Um, other than that, but other than that, the priests can, they can baptize, they can hear confessions, say mass, Mary and anoint the sick. So they, the other sacraments they can, they can celebrate. Um, deacons. Deacons are known in particular for being people called to serve. Diaconia is a word that means service. It's a ministry of service. The de first deacons who were ordained were, were meant to assist with the distribution of the daily bread. They were to be servants. They oftentimes were entrusted with the temporal goods of the church. They were the ones who had to safeguard the church's belongings. In the early in the early days of the church, so they were really called to service. They are known for preaching. They can preach, uh, they can distribute communion, and they can assist in other ways. But they actually don't celebrate most of the sacraments. They can baptize in certain circumstances. They can witness a marriage, but deacons don't say mass. Deacons don't hear confessions. Deacons don't anoint the sick, because anointing of the sick also, like hearing confessions involves the forgiveness of sins. So deacons cannot do that. Um, so if someone needs to be anointed, you'll get the sacrament of anointing a little bit later. Um, and, but a deacon cannot do that. That's where we would call a priest instead. Sometimes um, you might see people who are deacons and who are deacons for the rest of their lives. We call that the permanent diaconate. And permanent deacons, since Vatican II, Vatican II really revived this as a stable group of men. They can be married men. So it is possible for permanent deacons to be married men. 
Um, however, then there are deacons who are deacons for a short time and then they move on to become priests. So for example, I was ordained as a deacon, so I did receive the diaconate. Um, I was ordained a deacon in 1996, but I was ordained a transitional deacon. I was, not, I was uh, I ordained a deacon in preparations for priestly ordination. So priests were first ordained transitional deacons and then later in 1997, then a year later, I was ordained uh, a priest. Uh, bishops themselves, they too also were ordained at one time deacons and then, and then priests and then eventually bishops. Um, so transitional deacons and all priests and all bishops in, in the Latin rite take a vow of celibacy, promise of celibacy, so we remain unmarried and dedicated to service to the church. It is for the sake of being more available to serve um, that we take that promise of celibacy. Sometimes people ask, he says, wouldn't it be better if priests could get married? And you know, my answer to that is I would say, actually it would not, it would not. Uh, number one, you don't know what trouble you would be creating. So first of all, so the, wait, wait until you meet your pastor's wife and let me tell you who's really gonna be running the show around that. So, so no, it's, uh, um, no, but it would also, if the priests had families and it would really take up a tremendous amount of time and rightly so, and the, and the family would have a claim on the priest's time. And, uh, and so it would really lessen the, the availability of the priest to be able to, to serve. So I think that there's great wisdom in the, in the discipline of the church in the Latin rite um, to practice celibacy. How are men ordained as priests? They're ordained by the laying out of hands and by a prayer of consecration. So those are all things that a bishop would do. And in that um, sacrament, graces are given. The grace is necessary for the carrying out of the duties entrusted to that deacon or priest or bishop. Um, it is an indelible mark. They are forever marked. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, they would say, for, for those ordained as priests. And so therefore it can only be received once or three times. Well, you can only receive each order once. You're only ordained a deacon once. For those who go on to the priesthood, you're ordained a priest once. And for those ordained as bishops, they're ordained a bishop once. They're not ordained more than once. So like baptism and confirmation, they're sacraments that cannot be repeated. Um, the, uh, but they, it is one that definitely is dedicated to the service of God, God's people in order to foster holiness. Um, the, uh, sometimes people talk about the idea that um, only men can be ordained as priests. The church has understood this, that it was the will of Christ who chose the 12 men as the apostles. Um, that there are many different times in which Jesus had men and women present at certain things, but there was, in this, in this specific regard, Jesus exclusively chose men, and that's part of the, the um, tradition. So we'd say that that's part of apostolic, part, part of the um, teaching from apostolic times, part of the tradition of the church, um, as we would say, part of the revelation of God's divine will as part of the deposit of faith. So that's how we kind of understood that. Um, I know that's a debate that comes up, but that's kind of the, that's at least in, uh, the basic answer that's given um, in that regard. And there's definitely more that could be said about that. But in the interest of time, because I've gone over a little bit, um, we'll, we'll pause there. So um, this actually concludes our last class for the calendar year. We will take a break until um, after January 1st, and then we'll come back, and that's when we'll do confession and anointing. So there'll be a little bit of a break. The schedule on the website is, is updated and so it has the more accurate schedule. We had to do a little bit of shifting of classes, uh, but you'll have Father Stark uh, the first Wednesday then in January. As we come back, we'll take a couple weeks off for Christmas. Hope everyone has a, a safe and a happy Christmas that you're able to do so with whomever you're going to celebrate with, if you're able to be with family and, and all that. Um, so blessings upon everyone here. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of the Eucharist and the gift of the priesthood. We pray that you might call more men to the priesthood, um, to send more workers into the vineyard, um, so that way we, uh, so the kingdom of God can be more built. And as we gather around the Eucharist, may we truly recognize your presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity, and honor you who are truly our loving Savior and our Good Shepherd. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Very good.